This BYU devotional address with Cheryl A. Esplin was given on February 3rd, 2015. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm Matthew Richardson, and I've been asked to conduct this devotional. Today, we are pleased to have Sister Cheryl A. Esplin, second counselor in the primary general presidency as our devotional speaker. We welcome her husband, Max, who is seated on the stand, as well as their family members who, and friends who have joined us today. She was born and raised in Lovell, Wyoming, and graduated from BYU in elementary education. Sister Esplin has served in Relief Society, Young Women, and Primary. Additionally, she has served with her husband, Max Esplin, when he was a mission president in Raleigh, North Carolina. Sister Esplin was serving as a member of the Primary General Board prior to her calling as second counselor in the Primary General Presidency in 2010. Sister Esplin has said that working with children is one of the greatest blessings in life. Her roles as wife, mother, and grandmother are her greatest joys in life. The Esplins are the parents of four sons and have one daughter, and they have 24 grandchildren. And now we will have the wonderful opportunity from hearing from Sister Cheryl A. Esplin. Sister Esplin. It is an honor to be asked to speak at this devotional. Our family has a real loyalty to Brigham Young University. My husband and I, our five children and their spouses all graduated from BYU. As our grandchildren approach their college years, we hope that they will carry on the BYU tradition. As I thought about speaking here today, I reflected back on the days that I attended BYU a half a century ago. That makes me sound so old. I came to BYU from a small high school. There were less than 60 of us in our graduating class. I hadn't traveled much. Living on a farm meant there was always work to be done, cows to milk and water to change, and we didn't get very far from home. Coming to BYU was quite an exciting adventure for me. I admit I came a little starry-eyed with my head full of dreams as I looked forward to more independence, new friends, and new opportunities to prepare for my future. That's probably why I was a little disappointed when the first boy to ask me out on a date was a boy from my high school. <laughs> he was also the second one to ask me out, and the third, and the fourth. I became concerned that this hometown boy would begin thinking there was more to our relationship than I thought there was, and I determined that I needed to talk to him about it. One night, as he took me home from a date, I looked for just the right opportunity. As he took me to the door, and before I could say anything, he said, I was just wondering if you would like to go steady with me. It had happened just like I was afraid it would. And I quickly responded, oh no, I, I can't do that. I didn't come here to BYU to do that. I came here to date, meet lots of guys, have fun, meet lots of people. And as I went on and on, his eyes got wide. And then finally, when I paused to take a breath, he asked, what did you think I just asked you? A little puzzled, I responded, you asked me if I would like to go steady with you. He shook his head and said, No, I asked if you would like to go study with me. <laughs> S-T-U-D-Y, -S study. <laughs> Needless to say, he never asked me out again. <clears throat> and I offer this advice. If anyone asked you to go study or steady, ask them to spell it. <laughs> Recently, I was reading in the book of John, and I paused to ponder the Savior's words when he said, I am come that they, meaning you and me, might have life, and that they, you and me, might have it more abundantly. Everything the Savior did and said was for the benefit of, man, of humankind. 
his atonement, his example, his teachings, everything was to help us not only have a more abundant life on earth, but to attain the most abundant of all life, even eternal life. Today I would like to emphasize three principles the Savior taught that will lead us to live a more abundant life. One foundational principle is seeking light and truth. The Savior blesses those who are seeking diligently to learn wisdom and find truth. President James E. Faust said, Opportunities for the abundant life increase as we pursue the quest for truth and knowledge. President David O. McKay, a great proponent of learning and education, said it this way, to feel one's faculties unfolding and truth expanding the soul is one of life's sublimest experiences. Patricia, a graduate of BYU, described such an experience in a letter to Elder Merrill J. Bateman when he served as president of this university. Patricia told of sitting in a physics class where they were discussing fiber optics and how light how light travels perfectly through strands of plastic without losing energy. As the lecture proceeded, Patricia realized that all things point to Christ. Christ has all power and never loses energy as he influences our lives. She said, I sat in awe at the understanding that came to me not a physical understanding, but a spiritual understanding. A spiritual enlightenment filled my soul. I came out of the lecture on a spiritual high." End quote. I don't believe that experiences like Patricia's are uncommon here at BYU. In his inaugural address, President Worthen reaffirmed the mission of Brigham Young University to assist individuals in their quest for perfection and eternal life by providing a period of intensive learning that includes not just the arts, letters, and sciences, but also the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a blessed opportunity to attend a university where one can learn both secular and spiritual truths simultaneously, and not one at the expense of the other. In speaking about the uniqueness that underlies BYU, President Spencer W. Kimball said, This university shares with other universities the hope and the labor involved in rolling back the frontiers of knowledge. But we also know that through divine revelation, there are yet many great and important things to be given to mankind, which will have an intellectual and spiritual impact far beyond what mere men can imagine. He continued, Thus, at this university, among faculty, students, and administration, there is and there must be an excitement and an expectation about the very nature and future of knowledge." End quote. The search for knowledge, light, and truth is one of the reasons we are on earth. It is a lifelong pursuit that requires great effort and diligence on our part, whether by study or by faith. Keith W. Wilcox, a member of the Church and a prominent architect, shared an experience from his university years that illustrates this truth. As part of his thesis, while completing his Master of Architecture degree at the University of Oregon, his professor asked him to find one word or phrase that described the spirit of his church, then design a church building that would demonstrate that word or phrase. Keith told his professor that he felt a single word or phrase could not be found to describe the spirit of his church. His professor disagreed and said he felt what was missing from Keith's thesis was a simple description of the spirit of his church and a design that would express it architecturally. 
After the meeting with his professor, Keith knew he was up against a challenge that could keep him from entering his chosen professional field. He pondered his dilemma and then decided to interview his church leaders and other members of his ward. He received many suggestions, including faith, eternal progression, revelation, the Book of Mormon, priesthood, prophets and apostles, but he couldn't think of a satisfactory way to express any of these gospel principles architecturally. Pressure mounted as he wrestled with this problem. Living costs for his family were a concern with a delay in getting his degree. One night, as he pondered his problem, he realized he hadn't taken the challenge directly to Heavenly Father. He had prayed for guidance and sought advice from priesthood leaders, but he hadn't sought the Lord specifically for help in finding the word or phrase he needed. Humility filled his entire being. He had done all in his power to find an answer, but had not been able to find a solution on his own. He needed direct help. Keith found a quiet place to pray, then knelt and poured out his heart to his Heavenly Father. As he concluded his prayer, a word flashed into his mind, enlightenment. Then the, pra then the phrase, light and enlightenment, followed. Joy swept through him. His prayer had been answered. He thought of how light and truth have been restored in our day, how prophets, seers, and revelators continue to offer light and truth, how missionary efforts bring enlightenment to all who will listen, how temples glow with spiritual light and all who enter are taught eternal truths and enlightened. Suddenly, it was easy to envision a meaningful architectural design of one of our church buildings. He decided to build a building that would allow light to penetrate from the heavens all day long and that would radiate light heavenward each evening. The resubmission of his thesis that now illustrated the phrase, light and enlightenment, was accepted. His professors expressed great interest in both the history and the description of the spirit of our Church. Keith said, I am grateful to our, heaven, to our Father in Heaven for the insight and inspiration I received on that occasion. The deep meaning and spiritual significance of this experience have been a wonderful and continued blessing to me since that day. Keith went on to design many significant buildings and was part of the design team for the Washington, D.C. Temple and the Missionary Training Center in Provo, Utah. In his recent general conference talk about receiving a testimony of light and truth, President Dieter F. Uchtdorf said, and ever, The everlasting and almighty God will speak to those who approach him with a sincere heart and real intent. He will speak to them in dreams, visions, thoughts, and feelings. He will speak in a way that is unmistakable and that transcends human experience. He will give them divine direction and answers for their personal lives. God cares about you. He will listen and He will answer your personal questions. The answers to your prayers will come in His own way and His own time, and therefore you need to learn to listen to His voice." End quote. A second principle of living the abundant life is revealed in Isaiah's words, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Elder Joseph B. Worthland echoed this thought when he said, Our search for the abundant life is cloaked not only in the robes of this mortal clay, its true end can only be comprehended from the perspective of the eternities that stretch infinitely before us. Elder Worthland teaches us that an eternal perspective is important in our quest for the abundant life. In this journey of life, it is important for us to understand God's plan. Change, challenges, trials, and temptations are temporary and prepare us for eternal life. 
In a speech James A. Cullimore gave at BYU, he related an experience once told by religious writer Harley M. Rosenberger about a man who was walking across the United States on foot from California to New York. When the man had reached the halfway point, reporters interviewed him and asked him about the experience. One reporter asked, what has been your most difficult experience? Rosenberger describes the man's response. <clears throat> the traveler thought long. Through his mind went the toilsome climb over the mountain passes, hot, dry stretches of desert, sun, wind. <coughs> then he said quietly, I guess my greatest problem was that the sand kept getting into my shoes. Sand in his shoes, not some great crisis he had faced, not some danger that had almost taken his life, but sand, sand that wore blisters on the soles of his feet, sand that ground its way between the pores of his skin and irritated constantly, that made every step an agony sand in his shoes. Now there was one hint that the hiker suggested when the sand got into his shoes. He had to stop and dump the sand from them. In our journey in life, we too are troubled with sand in our shoes, sand in the form of change, challenges, trials, and temptations. We can either let these things stop us short of our goal or we can find ways to dump the sand from our shoes and continue our journey. My husband Max and I were married in the fall, and the next spring we both graduated from BYU. During this time, the military draft was in force, and Max had received a letter indicating that he would be drafted into the military service upon graduation. During Max's two years in the service, I taught school near my hometown so that I could be near my family. After his service, Max worked with his family ranching operation for a year. Then we decided he should come back to BYU to get more education. Finances were tight, and I was expecting our first baby, but we were able to find a tiny basement apartment that fit our budget, and he started school. Shortly after, Max was called to be the young men president. He was a little concerned because his studies were rigorous and took a lot of time, but he accepted the calling. One day, my husband came home quite devastated. He had received a C on his first test in a class that was critical to his major. He had studied hard, and now he began to doubt his ability to compete in that major. His shoes were filling with the sand of discouragement and doubt. For several days, he couldn't eat or sleep as he worried about what to do. He considered giving up and going back to, the life, on, to life on the ranch to do what he knew best and what he was comfortable with. After a lot of prayer and soul-searching, he decided to continue with his education and graduated with honors. In hindsight, the C on a test was such a little thing, but often it's, it is the little things, the little grains of sand that distract us and keep us from seeing with an eternal perspective. I will always be grateful that my husband was willing to dump the sand from his shoes and move on because he was willing to pay the price and move beyond his comfort zone. Many doors of opportunity were opened to him. Throughout his life, he has used his skills and knowledge not only to bless our family, but many others as well. Each new day <clears throat> brings with it the opportunity to evaluate where we are in terms of where we are going. Wherever we are on our journey, the Savior has made it possible through his redeeming and enabling power for us to dump the sand from our shoes. It's up to us to apply these powers in our life and to continue our journey strengthened with hope and faith. Heavenly Father, 
and our Savior want you to succeed. President Thomas S. Monson expressed his confidence in your ability to do so when he said, This is your world. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. A third principle of living an abundant life is feeling and expressing gratitude. The Lord promised, And he who receiveth all things with thankfulness shall be made glorious, and the things of this earth shall be added unto him, even an hundredfold, yea, more. In the January Ensign, a young woman named Elizabeth Stitt shared an experience she had learning about the power of gratitude. Her story was inspiring to me, not only because I know Elizabeth personally, but because it was a message I needed as well. She told of having the opportunity to do research for her undergraduate degree in the same city where she had a few months previously served a mission. As she traveled each day throughout the city to do her project, Heavenly Father blessed her in many ways. He guided her path and protected her. He gave her opportunities to share the gospel, and he multiplied her time so that she could do her project and also visit many of the people she had known and loved as a full-time missionary. She felt so blessed that every morning and night she poured out her soul in gratitude to her Father in Heaven for the chance to be there. Throughout the day, she prayed in her heart, thanking Him when her plans went smoothly. And when they didn't go smoothly, she thanked Him, because it usually ended up being better anyway. One day, as she sat pondering her experiences, she wondered why Heavenly Father was helping her so much. This thought came clearly to her mind. It is because you are being grateful. Elizabeth said, That day I learned that sometimes gratitude precedes the blessings. The more grateful I was, the more I could recognize the blessings I received and appreciate the lessons I learned from the difficulties. And the more I recognized the blessings and lessons, the more I had to be grateful for." End quote. It's interesting how gratitude works. We think we are giving back to the Lord by being grateful, but instead the Lord blesses us still more for being grateful. We are so greatly blessed, and most of us have done very little to merit the many blessings given us. Every time I read chapters 6 and 7 in Deuteronomy, I reflect on how indebted I am to the Lord and to all those who have gone before and sacrificed so much. After 40 years in the wilderness, the Israelites came to a mountaintop overlooking the land of promise. As Moses prepared them to enter this land without him, he spoke to them as a dying father speaks to his children. He told them what awaited them. The Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. And when thou shalt have, have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord. This is every bit as much a message to modern-day Israel, you and me. Too often, when we inherit or get things that others have worked and sacrificed so hard for, we don't appreciate them. Occasionally, we're not as grateful. We might even feel entitled, expecting things to just be handed to us for the taking. 
Joseph Smith and the early saints gave up all they had, sometimes several times, as they were driven from place to place for the gospel. Many sacrificed their very lives. We need to be grateful not only for those who went before and sacrificed so much, but especially grateful to God, from whom comes every good thing. Now is our time to contribute, our time to build, our time to dig, our time to plant. President Gordon B. Hinckley explained the importance of each of our contributions. We must ever keep before us, he said, the big picture while not neglecting the details. That large picture, he said, is a portrayal of the whole broad mission of the Church, but it is painted one brush stroke at a time through the lives of all members. Each of us, therefore, is important. Each is a brush stroke, as it were, on the mural of this vast panorama of the kingdom of God. We have talked about having the abundant life through seeking light, truth, and knowledge, through looking through the lens of an eternal perspective, and through feeling and expressing gratitude. The abundant life can be ours as we take advantage of these and so many other opportunities that are available to us in this day. I end with where I started. May we always remember that our Savior came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. I testify that He is the one that makes the abundant life possible. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This BYU devotional address with Cheryl A. Esplin was given on February 3, 2015. 